Now that we have our time series data, we are ready to do some analyses. I'm going to show you how to implement a principal components analysis or PCA on time series data. PCA is a multivariate dimension reduction method that finds a weighted combination of channels, or in our case, the identified cell bodies, such that the resulting components of this weighted combination maximizes variance. So I know it's quite a mouthful, so let me take a moment to explain the conceptual idea of PCA. First of all, here you see two time series showing a signal in yellow with low variance and the orange signal with relatively higher variance. So the goal of PCA is to figure out the optimal combination of neurons that maximizes the variance in the weighted average of cell time series. So let me sh start with a simple example. So here we see two time series and you can see they're really strongly correlated. So we can simply weight them equally. And the average already has a pretty high variance. So here you see two other time series that are negatively correlated. So if we were to average them together using the same coefficients that we used here, the result would actually have very low variance. So this is not good. Therefore, in this example, PCA will weight one of these time series negatively. So now the weighted average has high variance. Okay, so that's the idea. The mathematical details of how PCA works is beyond the scope of this course, but it basically involves an eigen decomposition of the data covariance matrix. But don't worry, MATLAB will take care of all of the details. So after applying the PCA, we can plot the first principal component time series and the average time series over all of the clusters. So zooming in, we can see that these two time series are pretty similar in some cases, though certainly not identical. And this tells us that our population of cells has a lot of activity in common over the four minute recording period. Next, we will visualize the principal component weightings on top of the average image, which is like an anatomical map. And now this visualization is really insightful because you can see that pretty much all of the somas, all these cell bodies are weighted in one direction, whereas this blood vessel artifact here is weighted very strongly in the other direction, as well as this small cluster here and uh, well, I don't know whether this corresponds to a small cell body or another artifact, but given that it is strongly correlated with these two artifacts and negatively correlated with all these cell bodies, I suspect that this is an artifact as well. Now, in a real data analysis, you would definitely want to go back and remove these artifacts here, these clusters, before further analyzing and interpreting the data. However, I decided to keep these in here for this teaching module because I think it really nicely highlights two important aspects of data analysis. First, visualizing your data is extremely important. You should visualize your data often and in many different ways. For example, here we are looking at an image, here we are looking at a time series. Second, although it's of course fine to rely on algorithms to process and analyze your data, you should never blindly trust any algorithm. Always check the results carefully. In this case, I think our fairly naive image processing based algorithm worked pretty well most of the time, but you can see it also missed quite a few cell bodies in here that we can see visually. Our algorithm missed these cell bodies. And of course, we have a couple of mislabeled artifacts that were identified as cells. Okay, anyway, now is the time to pause the video, switch to MATLAB, work through the partially completed MATLAB code, and now I'm going to switch to MATLAB and talk you through my solution. Implementing a principal components analysis in MATLAB is quite straightforward. We can use the PCA function here, and we just have to input the data set. Now, the only thing that's important to be mindful of here is that the orientation is in the, uh, or the, the, the data are inputted in the correct orientation. That orientation needs to be observations by features. And so in this case, the 
observations are the different cells and the features are the different time points. So this is the correct orientation. For example, if we had set up this entire code, if we had run everything slightly differently so that this matrix were time by cells, then we would want to transpose this matrix. Okay, so anyway, this is the correct orientation. The um, principal components analysis function returns several possible outputs. We are only going to be concerned with the first three, and actually mainly just the first two. That's going to be the uh, time series of all the components and also the principal components weightings for each of the cells. So we can have a look at the sizes here. We see that PCA-TS, so the principal components time series, is 7,700 by 78. So that corresponds to 7,700 time points by 78 components. Notice that this is a different orientation from the original data. So the data were clusters by time and the output is time by components. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is make a plot of the first principal component by the average of the activity across all of the clusters. Now, previously, I've been creating figures with multiple lines plotted on top of each other using separate lines, right? So I was doing plot something and then hold on and then plot, you know, time vec and, you know, something else here. That's fine. What I'm going to show you now is how to get multiple lines plotted in the same graph without using hold on. And basically that works by specifying x, y input pairs. So we have x and y, and then we have another pair of x and y inputs, and MATLAB is going to know to plot both of those as separate lines. So the first y input, the first thing that we want to plot is the neuron, the variable neuron ts filt. But now we don't want to plot all of the time series, we want to plot the average over the entire population of clusters that we've extracted. So we want the mean. And of course, we always need to think about which dimension we want to compute the average over. Now, this is a little bit tricky because previously, in the previous video, we were computing the average over time, which is the second dimension. Here, we actually want to compute the average over all of the clusters, over all the cell bodies. So that is the first dimension. So we're averaging over the first dimension. Now, it turns out that you don't need this because the default is to compute the average over the first dimension. However, sometimes I like to leave this comma one in there anyway. It's a useful reminder to me that I am really intending to average over the first dimension. And, you know, not that I just got lazy and forgot to add a uh, second input. Okay, so this is going to give us one line. Then the second line is going to be the principal component time series, so PCA-TS. And now we want the first component and all of the time points. So this is all comma one. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Make sure we get something. So we do, looks nice. It already looks like the figure that I showed in the slides. Okay, and then, yeah, just a couple of extra lines just to make this look a little bit nicer, adding a legend, X and Y axis labels. And uh, this line here sets the um, X axis limit. You can see there's some extra white space in here, which really annoys me. I really don't like this uh, extra white space. So I'm specifying that the X axis limits goes from the first time point to the last time point. Okay, and then I turn on the zoom functionality so that I can click and drag and zoom in and we can have a look at these time courses. And as I mentioned in the video, you see that uh, they're, they look pretty similar, right? It, you don't have to convince yourself that these are going to be correlated, that the average of all of the clusters is correlated with the largest principal component. Now we can actually do some additional visualizations. I would like to plot this uh, or inspect these, this relationship a little bit more. So I'm going to open up a new figure and I am going to plot instead of plotting both of these time series as a function of time, I'm going to plot one as a function of the other. So I will write plot mean neuron TS uh, filt by the PCA time series, all time points and first component. And let's plot these as circles. So now you see the X axis shows the average of all the clusters we've identified, the y-axis shows the first principal component over that population. And each dot corresponds to a single time point. So it's pretty interesting that uh, these are 
clearly positively related. There are, there's a, a correlation, but it's also not really that strong, right? It's not like there's a near one-to-one -one mapping. So in fact, looking at this visualization, I'm curious to quantify the actual relationship between these two time series. So to do that, I'm going to compute the correlation. So instead of plot, I'm going to compute the correlation between these two time series. Now the correlation function requires both inputs, so the two vectors that you want to correlate, to be column vectors. Now this already is a column vector, so that means that this is actually a row vector. So we need to transpose this first input to make sure that it's a column vector. Okay, and this tells us that the correlation between these two variables is only 0.3, so it's just about uh, a correlation of 0.4. So in fact, when I said that, you know, these two time series look really similar to each other, they in fact only correlate at about 0.4. And if you zoom in to, you know, random points in time, you'll find that there are some time windows where the two time series, so the average of all the clusters and the top BC, seem to be really strongly correlated, and other time windows where, you know, it doesn't look like they're really correlated at all. All right, so that was for inspecting the time series. The next thing that we want to do is visualize the principal component's weightings over space. So let's look through this code quickly before starting to go back and worry about filling in all of the little missing points. So what we're going to do is create a map of neurons, uh, or map of the clusters, putative neurons, that are colored according to their PCA score. And then here we are going to create, I call this an anatomical image, but it's actually just the grayscale version of the average map. Now this is a little tricky, there's a, there's a little bit of a trick in here, so I'm going to talk more about what's going on in this line in a few moments. And then what we are going to do is make an image of this anatomy map, and then plot on top of that the principal components map. You can see that I'm getting an image handle from here, and that's because I want to change some of the properties of this image. In particular, I want to change the alpha data, which is the transparency. So I'm going to change the transparency of the principal components map, and that's going to allow us to visualize both the um, grayscale anatomical image and the colored principal components scores at the same time. Okay, very good. So now let's go through this line by line. So we initialize a new matrix PC map that's the same size as the average map. So we can see that that is 256 by 455. And now we are looping through all of the clusters. And what I want to do is set the value of each cluster to be equal to the principal component scores. So the weightings. So that was from variable PCA scores. Let's have a look at the size of this matrix. So this was 79 by 78. That corresponds to the number of clusters in the data by the number of components that the PCA analysis returned. And we are only interested in the first component here. So we want comma one, and then we want the ith element in the first component. Okay, so that's going to create our PC map. And we can already have a look at this. So I will write image SC PC map. Now it's not so easy to see, particularly maybe, you know, maybe not on the video. So I'm going to set the current axis color limits to be minus one to plus one. And now you can see that all of the cell bodies are blue and looks like these artifacts and whatever's going on with this guy over here are yellow. Okay, so what I want to do is convert the average map into a grayscale image that has RGB format. So let's look at this average map again. So this was average map. So you can see that it's colored, but I don't want this to be colored. I want this to be grayscale. So what I'm going to do is concatenate three versions of the exact same average map. So avmap, avmap, avmap. This is a little trick in image processing to create a three-dimensional, uh, so an RGB format image when you only have a two-dimensional data. So you can see this is now a three-dimensional matrix where the third dimension is the RGB channels, but all of the three color channels are identical, which means that this will simply produce a grayscale image. So now we can look at uh, the anatomy, and you can see that that is grayscale. 
Okay, so let's do some visualizations. We draw the, well, it's exactly what I just showed, the anatomy image, and then hold on, and then the PC map. Now, the PC map has numerical values at every single pixel. So that means it completely plotted on top of the anatomy map. That anatomy matrix is still underneath. It's a layer underneath this PC map, but we don't actually see it. So therefore, we need to set the transparency of the PC map according to the th thresholded image, the binarized thresholded image that we use to identify all of these 79 clusters. So basically, that means that all of the pixels that are not included in any cluster have an alpha value, so a transparency value of, well, an alpha value of one, which means that they are totally transparent. Okay, and then we can change the color limit. And now I'm going to change the color map from the default parla to something called blue, white, red. This is not a map that comes with MATLAB. This is a script that comes with the MATLAB files that you have downloaded for this section. Okay, and then yeah, I'll just set the axis to be square. Okay, so now this looks really neat. Now we can interpret the data on top of the average map, which is like an anatomical image. And now it's really clear that these are blood vessel artifacts here. And if you look carefully, you can also see there's another scan path artifact all the way up here. We got this one down here, but we actually missed this other cluster all the way up here. This is not coming from a neuron. This is an artifact in the image. So if these were, you know, if this were your data set, you were doing analyses, you would definitely want to look at this result and go back and adjust the algorithm. Make sure these two are getting removed. You don't want to interpret these as being, you know, actual brain cells and try to tweak the algorithm to additionally include some of these other uh, cell bodies here. And that concludes module five of this course. You learned about calcium imaging data. You learned about a naive image processing based algorithm to isolate, to identify cell bodies in calcium imaging data. Some pre-processing and we closed off with a principal components analysis.